incredibly inspired by the two previous speakers. And I think that that's probably true for many of you. Um, what Colin said about purpose is something I feel uh, very deeply about as well. And I've been involved with the creation of the Public Benefit Corporation statute in the United States. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we now have three PBCs in the Union Square Ventures portfolio. So there is some progress. It may be early, um, but there are early signs that we can create different corporate forms that put purpose on the same level as other priorities of the corporation. Now, I want to take a very different approach to talking about new ownership challenges by putting the corporation in a historical context, and I'm not going to do nearly as great a job as Colin did because this is his field. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take a highly, highly abstracted view, and I'm going to strip away all the beautiful detail that Colin provided to try and focus on one very specific aspect. And I'm going to do so by placing the corporation in a brief history of all of humanity. And voila, there you go, here it is. Conveniently grouped into four big ages. Um, and the plan for this talk is that I'm going to quite rapidly go through this, and I'm going to point out why the corporation, even though, as Colin pointed out, it's been around for a long, long time, going back to Rome, but why it rose to prominence in the industrial age. What was specific about the industrial age that made the corporation and its ownership so important? And the reason for talking about that is because we are really here. We are with one foot firmly in the industrial age, and we have another foot that, yesterday I learned to do this, I think. We have another foot that's kind of groping for a new age, which many people refer to as the information age. That, by the way, I think is a terrible misnomer, and if I have time, I will explain why I think that's a bad name. So with that as the program, let's jump right in. Forager age, Homo sapiens is around 250,000 years or so, and during that time, the kind of defining scarcity for humanity was food. Your tribe either found enough food, or it starved, or it had to migrate. And as a result, the rough organization of humanity was that we were migratory, we had these very flat tri tribal organizations, we were most likely promiscuous, um, and we had these animistic religions where every rock, every animal had a spirit in it. Fast forward to about 10,000 years ago, and 10,000 years ago, we made some big technological breakthroughs. We discovered that there are seeds, you can put them in the ground, you can pour water on them, and they grow faster, and you can domesticate animals. And that's all a wonderful thing, because all of a sudden, the food density of land goes up by like 100x. Um, and so the scarcity is no longer food directly, the scarcity now becomes land. And in that transition, which, mind you, if you take this very long-scale view, isn't that long ago, 10,000 years, in that change, we change just about everything about how humanity lives. We go from being migratory to being sedentary. We go from flat societies to extremely hierarchical societies. We go from being promiscuous to being monogamous. Um, we go from animism to theism. Suddenly, we have all these religions that have deities in them. So, Lots of big, big changes. Then much more recently, a couple hundred years ago, we come upon the Enlightenment. That's a very good thing. And with the Enlightenment comes science. And with science, we can do all the sudden amazing new things. We can make fertilizer. We can build tractors. And as a result, the scarcity shifts again. With the Industrial Age, the scarcity is no longer land the scarcity becomes capital. And by capital, I don't mean financial capital, because we don't you know, plow the fields with um, dollar bills, it's tractors. I mean physical capital. We don't clothe ourselves in gold coins, we wear clothes that are made somewhere. So the thing that matters all of a sudden is the formation of physical capital. And as we make this transition, we again change just about everything of how humanity lives, for the most part. We move from the country to the city. Instead of living in extended families, we live in the nuclear family or no family at all. Ex there was a lot of comments, all of a sudden we have private property everywhere. 
Um, we change theology. When religion told you before you're a farmer and you know we're going to tell you how to be a great farmer, but you'll never be a noble person, now we have the Protestant work ethic. Work hard, and the harder you work, the better off you will be. So again, we've kind of changed a lot of very fundamental things. Now, one other thing that we change, and we change very profoundly during that time, is how we organize economic activity. We go from mostly markets to markets and firms, and firms playing a very, very dominant part of the economy. And why is that? Well, in all of human activity and organizing human activity, to some degree, there's a trade-off between motivation and coordination. What do I mean by this? It becomes clearer when we place the market on this map. So if you think of a market, a traditional market place, um, and I'm going to use shoes as an example, you go into a market and there are different people selling shoes, handmade shoes. This is going back to the agrarian age, let's think. Um, that market indexes very high for motivation. As a shoemaker, I want to make good shoes so that people will buy my shoes. But it's very uncoordinated. In fact, it's purposefully uncoordinated. I'm going to make different shoes from the person who's selling shoes next to me so that you'll buy my shoes, not their shoes. So it's great. It really brings out a lot of motivation. I will take a lot of pride in my craftsmanship. I want to make the best possible shoes so people are going to go buy my shoes. Now, the firm, on the other hand, turns out to do great at coordination. Let's say all of a sudden we have machines and we're going to make our shoes using machines. And we're going to break the process of making a shoe down into different stages. You know, one person just does one stitch, the next person uses a different machine to do a different stitch, the next person uses a different machine to attach the sole. Now I need this coordination problem. I need those machines to operate much of the time. I have suppliers who are bringing in leather. I need the machines to operate so that the leather doesn't pile up. I need the stuff from the first machine to make it to the second machine, to the third machine. It all needs to be really coordinated activity. I'm going to make the same shoe. That's another form of coordination. And this is why the firm becomes very important. Because what the firm does is it mutes incentives. That's why it has less motivation. When I say the firm mutes incentives, what do I mean by this? Well, let me explain it a little further. Capital is a big investment. It's a bunch of machines that I had to put in a place. And I'm going to start paying people. I'm going to say to them, look, I will take care of selling it. I will take care of producing the supplies. You just take care of this one thing that I'm asking you to do. And in return, your pay is just going to depend on that one thing. I'm either going to pay you some hourly wage, or maybe I'll pay you a piece rate. But I'm going to have you just focus on this one thing. And I'm, that's muting incentives, because why? If I pay you an hourly rate, now it no longer depends on your output. So maybe you'll start to slack off and make fewer shoes. Or if you pay, I pay you a piece rate, maybe just go really fast, but you don't watch out for the quality. So in the market, my incentives were to make the best possible shoes. In this new system, I'm highly coordinated, but I no longer have the same incentives that I had in the market. And because, if you remember my earlier big picture history of humanity, because capital was the scarcity in the industrial age, that's why the firm really rose to extraordinary prominence, because the firm has that ability of coordinating labor around capital and thus make capital powerful by muting the incentives that existed in the market. And then we had another big innovation, and that was combining the firm with the notion of a corporation which has a limited liability and the notion of equity in the corporation. Um, every spring I teach a class at NYU <clears throat> for MBA students, and I always ask the question, why do firms require financing? And I'm always amazed to see that very few students can give a short and precise answer to this question. The short and precise answer is, the präzise Antwort ist, dass Outflows, also Cash Outflows, oftmals auch von... That's why firms require financing. If you can make cash come in first, you don't need financing. And I highly recommend it. It's much better than taking money from outside investors. So that's why firms require financing. And then having limited liability is an extraordinary innovation because it means that somebody who provides 
capital, like myself, if we invest $5 million into a company, the most we can lose is $5 million. We're not going to go to jail, we're not going to lose $100 million, and that's because of the limitation on liability, unless we commit fraud, let's say. And that's important because that allows for risk-taking, and risk-taking was very important to allow for innovation. And having the equity piece also makes it possible to take debt financing where the debt is much more secure because the equity can grow and shrink and absorb some of the risk. So this was an important innovation, and we shouldn't forget that this innovation made this financial innovation and this organizing of human activity innovation made a lot of the other innovation possible that we now all benefit from. So a lot of the rapid innovation that took place during the industrial age was in fact made possible by this. So this was a very positive thing. And I think as Colin pointed out, it has gone completely overboard because we've taken it to some completely illogical extreme where we started to just focus on one tiny aspect of it, which is the financial profit. But the fundamental setup of saying, hey, there's a structure that can coordinate human activity and that can solve for the scarcity of capital, that was actually a very good thing. So now, let me come back to this idea that we're actually in an interim period. This is going to turn out to be important because I think some of the challenges for ownership going forward are going to be somewhat different from the challenges of ownership in the past. And that's what I want to get to next. It's really important to understand that the transition from the industrial age into the information age is going to be as profound as the prior transitions. And I think I made this point very clearly. When we went from the forager age to the agrarian age, and then from the agrarian age to the industrial age, we changed just about everything about how humanity lives. And it would be silly to somehow assume that this is not going to be the case in the presence of a new technological shift, namely digital technology, that is as profound as those prior shifts. So what are some of the things that may be changing? We, we can see some of them already. Some of them are happening already. People are going from having a job for a very long time to maybe being freelance. Some of them do freelance very successfully. Some are in a very, what people call the precariat. They don't know where their next job is going to come from or how much it's going to pay. We are seeing people go from working in an office to working remote, distributed co-working. We're seeing humans being replaced by machines in many um, applications. And we're seeing a movement from the dominance of markets and firms to the dominance of networks, which are kind of a new beast. Now, before I go, I'm going to go into specifically starting with this first question of the move to networks and what that means to ownership. And then I'm going to go back and talk about what this move away from the job may mean for the challenges of ownership. But before doing that, I want to talk about what is the new scarcity. Because I'm arguing that capital is no longer the scarcity. In fact, the defining scarcity of the information age is attention. What do I mean by this? Well, we each only have 24 hours in the day. I wish I could change that, but I don't think I can. And whatever we did yesterday, is irretrievably gone. What you paid attention to yesterday, you cannot go back and change. So your attention, individually and collectively, our global attention, is fundamentally limited. And I would argue we are having a big scarcity of attention because for most people, at the personal level, they're not giving nearly enough attention to this question of purpose. We talked about purpose at the corporate level, but what about purpose at the individual level? Now, I think this is an audience where many people have found their purpose. But I think if you go out and ask a lot of people about what their purpose is, I don't think they can tell you. And it's not something they're paying a lot of attention to. Why? Because they're super busy having a job. They're super busy worrying about how to keep that job or how to find the next job. And the rest of the time, they're refreshing their Twitter feed. So that's at the personal level. And at the collective level, there are these very large problems that humanity faces, such as climate change, that we're not paying nearly enough attention to. Um, now, why am I saying capital is no longer scarce? Obviously, you can't get free financial capital, and obviously, machines still cost money. 
But it's not the thing that's holding us back. And if you look at a place like China, where they literally stamp entire new train stations out of the ground within the space of a week, you realize that capital is not the thing that's, at this point, truly scarce in the sense of something that, if we don't address, it's going to be a big problem. But attention, if we don't address attention, that's going to be a big problem. So I promised that I would talk about networks. So one way to think of this chart is that there's some trade-off inherent between motivation and coordination. You can either get a lot of motivation at the lack of coordination, or you can get a lot of coordination at the lack of motivation. But it turns out we now have a new thing, and that new thing is called a network. And that allows us to do better on both counts. We can have sort of significantly more motivation and more coordination than we were able to achieve previously. And what do I mean when I say network? Well, I mean these things, things like Facebook, Amazon, Google, Airbnb, Uber. These all share something in common, which is that they operate a structure, which I'm calling a network, and then we individually or as companies can exercise a lot of initiative inside of these structures, but they're all connected to each other by virtue of this information layer that's been created. Um, and these networks, what they have is they have a network effect. What that means is, by my being active on the network, I create value for everybody else who's active on the network. So there's a positive externality of activity on networks. You might say, wait, one of these on this list is not like the other. Google isn't a network, you might say. No, but it is. Every time you search on Google, you actually make Google a little smarter about the kind of thing you're looking for. And so if I subsequently or somebody else searches for that, Google is actually better. That's why it's been so hard to compete with Google, because the search volume is actually a network effect. So these really are dominant networks. Networks are great. It's amazing that this technology makes networks possible, but they raise really interesting challenges. One of the challenges is that they have a lot of market power. Because of the network effect, there usually is a dominant network, and that dominant network is usually much, much larger than the next network. That's one problem. Another problem is that those networks that exist in the media space, their interest is really in hogging our attention, the very thing that's scarce in the information age. Let me um, explain this second point, this attention hogging point, with the example of Facebook. And um, full disclosure, we were the first investors in Twitter, so. Um, we, 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 Twitter is certainly no exception to this attention-hogging problem. So on the one side, you have a chart of uh, Facebook's user growth. On the other side, you have a chart of uh, Facebook stock price. And basically, the idea is very simple. The more of global attention that Facebook hogs, the more valuable Facebook is. And that's a problem because we've basically taken a model that worked ve quite well for forming physical capital, and we've applied that same model to trying to form networks and to govern networks. And that's not working out very well for us. So that's the first ownership challenge of the information age. Who should own networks? And I think there are two interesting possible answers. One answer is possibly steward ownership. Kickstarter is a company in our portfolio. It's a much smaller network. It's a network of people who want to do creative things and people who want to fund creative projects. But it's a network. And one possible answer is steward ownership, and it's something that Kickstarter is exploring but hasn't actually done yet. The other possible answer, which is sort of very much more speculative and brewing on the horizon, are blockchains. Um, Algorand is a, is a project that we've invested in from Unisquare Ventures. And the idea of blockchains is, what if the network actually belongs to the participants of the network as opposed to belonging to a network operator? And what Algorand is trying to build is a network where all the governance questions of the network are actually voted on by the participants in the network. Um, so we maintain network effects using information technology, but we have done away with the central network operator that becomes the extraction point for benefits. So this is one really interesting challenge of ownership in, as we make this transition into the information age. 
Now, there are many people in the audience who maybe run a more industrial or own a more industrial business, and they may go, well, this isn't relevant to me. I don't operate a network. So let me point out maybe another challenge of ownership as we make this transition. Um, we heard the talk yesterday about the history of the Bosch firm, and we heard a lot of talk about you know, the commitment to employees, but maybe in the information age, we need to make a different commitment to employees. So maybe the idea that I, as the um, operator or owner or um, trustee of the firm, that my role is to provide employment for a long period of time, maybe that's not the right model as we transition into the information age. Maybe if we believe that labor will be more fluid, if we believe people will move around more, um, and frankly, if we think that part of what we should be doing here is as much as possible, in fact, using machines to substitute for labor, is, there's a lot of labor where it would be good in a way if a machine carried this out, right? I mean, um, there's dangerous labor, there's boring, repetitive labor, um, that's what Graeber calls bullshit jobs. I mean, there's lots of things where it would actually be good to have a machine carry this out. And so maybe the, one of the challenges here is to think about, okay, if, if I believe all of that's happening, maybe the commitment I need to make to my employees is quite different. Maybe it's not about committing to employ them for a very long time, but maybe it's to commit to train them so that they can succeed, whether it's within my enterprise or completely independently of my enterprise. And I want to leave you with one other potential challenge as we're transitioning from the industrial age to the information age. Something else that stood out to me in the talk about um, Bosch yesterday was they filed something like 10 or 11 patents a day. A big chunk of the industrial age was about hogging intellectual property. It was saying, I'm going to try and lock this up for myself so I can use it and nobody else can know about it. It's patents, it's trade secrets, etc. But if we have this amazing information network where we can share information much more efficiently and effectively than ever before. And if we also think that we've got big problems as humanity that we should be solving collectively, things like climate change or infectious disease, maybe one of the challenges for owners and ownership is, well, maybe I should be taking my intellectual property and be sharing it widely, even if that means that I'm reducing the value of my immediate enterprise, but I am contributing to the acceleration of this knowledge loop. And I believe if we don't accelerate the knowledge loop, then we're not going to overcome these big problems. Like the history of humanity that I laid out is one of progress, and I firmly believe in progress, but progress means we solve one problem, and by solving that problem, we create a new set of problems. We solve the problem of individual mobility by introducing the automobile, and we create the problem of climate change. And if we don't solve this next problem, and the only way we're going to solve it is through continued innovation, it's not by going back into the past. So we need to accelerate this knowledge loop. And with the information age, we have the mechanism for accelerating it. But if we continue hogging information inside, then we may not succeed in doing this. Uh, if you want to read a lot more about these kind of thoughts, I also have a book. It's not in paper form. It's online, and you can find it at this URL. Thank you so much.